that's the whole focus of what we're going to talk about today, actually, is looking at things going through the back door instead of the front. Looking at how we do things now, seeing what boat that puts us in, and then looking at what the brain science tells us we can do that easily help us fly over these hurdles that we've been fighting for years. Now, what? So digs by that, and it's actually quite, if you really just sit and look at what makes sense, it, it's right on the money. They receive inferior reading instruction because when you're looking at a kid who reads at a first grade level but he's in fourth grade, the reading instruction that that fourth grade teacher can deliver is inferior to the reading instruction that he should have and would have gotten if he were on a first grade level in first grade. Who's best qualified to teach first grade reading? That first grade teacher. Where's the most time going to be spent on working those skills? In first grade. You know, by the time the kid's in fourth grade, there's a very limited window of time that there is going to be to work on first grade level skills. And the least experienced person actually isn't even the fourth grade teacher. It might be the volunteer or the bus driver who's nice enough to walk in and help, you know, work with some kids. Uh, what really matters is early, intensive, and expert literacy instruction at K2. That's what really matters. I'm not saying we have this already. I'm saying that this is what actually really makes the difference. And Professional development for pre-K-2 teachers produces greater gains than any sort of one-on-one -on -one tutoring, and that includes pull-out resource intervention retention. It's that highly focused, targeted, expert, early, intensive instruction that we need, and we need it at the grade levels where it's actually intended to be taught. Now, there's a reason why often this does not happen, and it's not the teacher's fault. There is a giant elephant in the room when it comes to teaching the code. You try to teach something that makes no sense whatsoever. I mean, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. You will tell kids, let's say, the alphabet. You know, Y says, yo, yo, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you march to your calendar, which is also part of your curriculum, and you proceed to show them a thousand times where Y does everything except say, yeah, because you've got words on the calendar like January, July, May, Sunday. Every time they see that Y, it's doing something totally different than the one sound that's on the assessment for, let's say, kinder, which is Y says, yeah. Our favorite words, mommy, candy, daddy, uh, this book is I, this author, that's the boys bathroom. You are literally non-reinforcing or unreinforcing a skill ten times more than you're able to reinforce it by working with text because we do want to immerse learners in text on a constant basis. The problem is text doesn't behave. You, and I see the code as something best served on a buffet because a buffet means you get what you need when you need it. It's all right there and it's open access. I'm not going to make you eat your salad before you get your steak. It's open access. If you want to write about your mouse, help yourself. Whatever it is you're looking to read or write about, the skills that you need are, are open and plentiful and here. And it's not something where I'm going to deliver them to you at specific intervals based on what I think or what my curriculum tells me I need to do. Now, I'm not saying you want to thwart your curriculum. Your curriculum is laid out in a nice kind of check and balanced way, but you need as much of the code as early as you can get it to fully partake in these reading and writing experiences because the more you bring to the table, the more value you take away. So the goal of the game is how much can we give our kids to have, to own, to feel comfortable with so that when we write about something or read about something, they're more fully able to dive in and engage and not just dive in with four letters and ten sight words. That doesn't necessarily motivate them to take the most out of those rich literacy experiences. Letters and sounds, and by letters and sounds I mean individual letters and sounds, into the heads and the mouths, lips, tongue, and teeth of your early grade learners in two weeks to two months and you're done. Finished. Over. So that simultaneously to that, you can actually be tossing out other things. And this whole base of, of skillability can be built, as opposed to maybe spending a letter a week or even spending six months teaching, you know, kids who just want to lick the carpet a K. Because, it, you know, in kinder, that's half your battle, is being more interesting than a shoe or the carpet. Because there's a grown-up reading and writing secret in that word that you don't know. Now, I'm a grown-up. So I have a really big grown-up sized brain, which means it can hold all these secrets. You're a kid, you have a kid sized brain, which means it's smaller than mine, which means I've got to be careful, because if I tell you a giant grown-up reading and writing secret before your brain's ready, your brain could explode. <laughs> and now I will say, if you do teach in an early grade, be careful when you say that, because you'll set your criers back off again if it's the beginning of the year. So use that once they know your personality. But the reason behind that is an old brain-based tenant, which is I've got it, you want it, I'll decide if you can have it, but I wouldn't hold my breath. It's big. Now, what's interesting is looking at the brain and where this lies. The brain develops back to front. 
The back part of the brain is the social emotive center. So that's the feeling network. That part is highly developed when learners come to pre-K. They already know how it feels when no one wants to play with them. They know how it feels when they get to be the line leader. You don't have to teach that part of the brain. You don't have to tell them or to direct them how to feel if no one wants to play with them at recess. You don't have to say, Johnny, listen, you have no friends and nobody wants to be with you. You should be crying. Um, <laughs> Would you like me to write in your journal like a sad face with some tears and then that way tomorrow if you bring it to recess and you don't know what to do when nobody wants to play with you, you can look at your journal and it'll tell you you should cry. You know, you don't have to memorize what just makes sense. So if we're tapping into an area that drives their decision making and their behavior on a constant basis, we're just letting that area drive the decision making to work with all this unfamiliar text. So There's that a social emotive awareness that learners develop far before they come to us. The higher level processing is the front area of the brain, the executive processing center. That is a, a landmine trap for struggling upper grade learners and for early grade learners half the time it's not even built. I mean, you're, you're the dead wasteland. <laughs> so the higher level processing center is the area of the brain that actually is supposed to tune in and take part and pull these skills. And for a lot of learners, it's a part of the house that's either not built or there hasn't been good foundation laid for them to get to those networks proficiently. So when we sneak things in the back door, we're talking about that social emotive affective learning domain, taking advantage of that intelligence that lies there, which in this case, this AUAW, that is being stored and retrieved in the part of the brain that attends to social feedback and feels embarrassed. That's what these little arrows show right here. So the part of the brain that makes you feel embarrassed or that attends to social feedback is the area of the brain that we have tricked into storing this information. And brain plasticity is what allows us to do this. Um, brain plasticity means that, you can't, that your brain will naturally reassign responsibilities to stronger areas to circumvent areas of weakness that no longer can function or, or take in those tasks. If we know that the brain has the ability to kind of reroute where things are housed, then we can help that process along by disguising content in such a way as to trick a stronger area to take it in and keep it. That way it's there and it's accessible and ready to be used by learners who maybe wouldn't be ready to learn it, but they can certainly be handed it. Now, telling a story is the easiest way to engage this affective feeling domain because stories activate all areas of the brain and it's the emotional part of the brain that we want to trigger for deeper connections. So the trick is to artificially weave skills in such a way that we can take advantage of those parts of the brain that learners are already strong with. It's and carry this thinking framework into text he has never seen. And that's really what we're trying to do. The brain is like a bookie in Las Vegas. We want best betting odds for Las Vegas. So when kids come to text they have never seen, we want them to be able to look at a word and bring to that word the best betting odds for Las Vegas when it comes to how am I going to attack that word. And if he knows that you're going to be sneaky back here and up here you're not going to be, that gives him the best foot up to know what sounds to try, even in a word he's never laid eyes on before. Same thing when he's writing, because writing is a window into the mind of a reader. You'll be able to see some telltale signs that this is kindergarten writing, even though it's going to look ridiculous for kindergarten writing. Now, this is kindergarten. This is what I'm going to call an average sample, and the reason I'm going to call it average is there's our new paradigm shift. Low is over here, the far left, average is in the middle, high is on the end. Now, I've taught kinder I've taught all the grades, but I've taught kinder long enough to know that is not at all a typical high, medium, and low. As a matter of fact, that low is high in kinder. That high is ridiculous in kinder. That could even be average for fourth if you really think about it. So I know this looks totally wrong. And nothing stops a writer writing faster than having no idea what they just wrote down. And writing makes you a better reader. Reading makes you a better writer. It's all really the same thing. If you're a Morse code operator, sending the code makes you a much better receiver. Receiving messages makes you a much stronger sender. It's the same thing backwards. So we want to keep kids engaged in writing. We want kids to keep reading that book that they really like without having to stop at every third word because they don't know that pattern yet and that sound yet. The more we can give them a motivation to engage in the books they're actually interested in reading or the stories they actually want to tell, the better and the stronger a reader-writer they are. So these are the kind of frameworks that are so easy to put in place if you understand the system of the brain and you understand how you can rob the bank and get around those alarm systems. And it really will open up an entirely different world for readers because when you know what's inside the box, it is incredibly easy and actually far more fun to think outside of it. And outside of the box is where they need to be when they're applying that critical thought. Now, I know it's 3.30. I'm going to take one minute to tell you one thing that you will immediately find out 
when you get to your classroom if you start playing with this or tell any other teacher about it. Even teachers might say, well, what about the word have? Okay, have doesn't work. Secret doesn't work. Word should behave. What about the word river? Right? You said mommy E one letter away, that should be river. So see, then what? So then we're back in the problem where it doesn't do what it's supposed to. Here's what you say to keep it back here. When a learner comes up and tells you it doesn't work, have should be have and river should be river. So it doesn't work. All you do is say, you're right, honey. Uh, where should you be though right now? <laughs> and he'll say, my, my, my seat. Okay, right, but you're not at your seat. You're in the next most likely place I'd expect to find you, which of course is right here at my desk. Do you know where the third most likely place is I would go to look for you if you weren't at your seat or at my desk? I bet you guys know. The bathroom, right? Because that's the third most likely place that you like to go. Now, you would never think to just go hop up on the desk of the principal and climb up in his cabinets, right? That would be crazy. You wouldn't do that. Letters are just like you, especially the vowels. They don't just lose their minds and do whatever they want. A is never going to go B. L is never going to say S. -s. All they do, and it's usually the vowels that do it, is something they're perfectly able to do anyway. It just might be the next most likely thing, next most likely sound. So what else could A say in the word have? Well, it could say A or A, but it's not supposed to because mommy is there. I know, honey, but where are you supposed to be right now? <laughs> Am I C? Right, so let's just try that other sound you said it could make. Let's see. H -a -v. Surprise, did it work? Yeah, we got the word. What about the word river? What else could I say? Well, could see it, but it's not supposed to because mommy is. I know, honey, but again, where are you supposed to be right now? <laughs> so they get the idea that we don't always behave and letters don't either, but we don't just lose our minds and do random stuff. We do the next most likely thing. So the, it's not phonics -y because phonics doesn't work the way the brain works. It's more behaviorally. But, you know, we have a lot of tricks. You might hear about sparkly E or magic E. Teaching with the brain in mind, you've got good, better, best. It is definitely good to have a hook. Any hook is better than no hook. Best hook is taking advantage of an area in the brain that already functions beautifully and fluidly and applying that to the area that's not quite in the program yet. So we want to keep things real with things kids already use to decide things in their own life. And that's the kind of thinking that happens back here. And yet he can apply that kind of thinking to navigate his decision making with unfamiliar text. It's a perfect storm because we're taking what already drives their decision making on a daily basis and we're using it to give them a leg up on text they've never even seen before. <laughs>